At this point, we've already checked out some stuff about the Edison companies inventing entertainment and some of the early motion picture and sound devices. So I think that this is a good time to reference electricity and electrical theory. And um, I'm going to throw a lot of stuff out, out at you. I will say right up front, I'm not a physics teacher. I'm not a science teacher. I'm not a chemistry teacher. But there are a little bit. Of, I'm also not a math teacher. But uh, there's a little bit of each one of those things in here. If you end up taking a class like Auto Shop in the hall over there, or you take a physics class or anything like that, hopefully you will experience something that is just a little bit similar to what I present. I would take that if you if you tend to notice some things that are congruent or similar between what you learn in your welding class, your manufacturing class, if your teacher says something pretty similar about electricity, I would take that as evidence that there's probably some underlying truth and there's something that's consistent between all fields of study. So maybe there's a good chance that it's sort of true. So here we go. We're going to talk first about this idea and it's a vocab word. I will drop a lot of vocab words on you. It's called an analogy. An analogy is something that's kind of a story about one thing, but it might have meaning in a different field. Um, one of the ways that people oftentimes explain electricity, without getting into all of the um, all of the labels and all of the vocab terms, is called the water analogy. Within the water analogy, it's really easy to um, think about a river flowing. Anybody ever float on a river on an inner tube or a kayak or canoe or something like that? So there's some points in the river where the river is going faster and you move through the, the river pretty fast and there's some points where things change and you're suddenly moving very slowly through the river. Usually there's the same amount of water flowing through both parts of the river but uh, one of the main things that changes which will affect your speed is the size of the river that the water is flowing through in that part. So um, if you get to the part of the river that's really big and there's a lot of room for the water to go through, do you go fast or slow? What do you think? Slower. Go really slow through that part. But if you get to the fast part of the river, what's usually um, going on there? Like things change, things get narrow, things get shallow. You go over rapids, and there's a lot of water that has to get through that small part. So most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about about electricity really follows that idea, the water analogy. This section over here on the board, I'm going to end up drawing a water tower that kind of represents the water analogy. So I'm going to try to leave that space. So I'm going to start dropping some terms on you, though. Light travels at 186,000, what do you think it is? Do you think it's miles per hour? No, it's miles per second. You don't have to write that down, but I'm gonna kind of reference it for other things. So 186,000 miles per second, what's that in the metric system? I don't know, you'd have to think of it, you'd have to translate it and figure it out for me. So light travels in an interesting form that we don't fully understand. Um, light moves as a photon, there you go with the Greek word roots, light moves as a photon which behaves a little bit like a particle and it behaves a little bit like a wave. So we don't fully understand how light works but that 186,000 miles per second, a lot of scientists think that that's the universal speed limit for anything. Um, another thing that travels at, at or close to the universal speed limit um, is a little bit more of a chain reaction. So um, instead of a photon, we're going to be breaking things down. We're going to look at um, an atom, and we're going to break it down into what we call subatomic particles. I told you there's a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of physics here. So I'm going to draw an atom, and it's uh, made up of subatomic particles. We're zoomed in really far. so. Here are some clusters of particles that are put together. And uh, some of these are protons that have a positive charge. How does it have a positive charge? Um, 
Ask your chemistry teacher. All right. Some of these things have a positive charge, and some of them are neutral, so they don't have a charge. But we'll say a few of those have a positive charge. You can have different atoms that make up different substances. Subatomic particles work together a lot of times where you'll have negatively charged particles that balance out these positively charged subatomic particles. Yeah, and so um, this is called an electron ring. These guys are electrons, these negatively charged subatomic particles. I'm going to draw another electron ring. And, um, yeah, that has a couple of electrons in it. We'll put that one there. And what I'm noticing right now is this outer shell has one more electron than I see protons in this atom. So this thing is possible, what we're going to talk about. So these guys are spinning all around here super, super fast. Maybe at the speed of light. Maybe. And if I have more than one of these atoms in a substance, all these atoms are um, up against each other. They're sharing the space. We zoomed out a little bit. So um, we've got all these electrons going, and there's maybe an extra electron that doesn't balance out with the protons. If there's something that might, for any reason, excite this extra electron that's on the outside, it might go and bump into the extra electron that's on the next atom in that substance. So if we have something where there's enough of this, enough of this material, and these extra electrons start to create a chain reaction where they're going to bump and excite the next one, 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 we might have a thing. We might have an occurrence that's called electric current. Okay, we're going to get back to this word current, uh, but I want to talk about a few things that are necessary for this chain reaction to happen. Um, first of all, it's really important what we have here. Whatever this material is that has all the protons and neutrons and electrons, or it had an excited extra electron, uh, whatever that material is, is of the most importance. It has to be, oh, I'm going to start to write things, things you need for electric current. All right, so here's some things that you need for an electric current. Checklist. First of all, we need what we call a conductor, C-O-N-D-U-C-T-O-R, something that conducts our electric current. Who thinks they know what a good conductor is? Off the top of your head, if you say something that's wrong, I'm not going to make fun of you, tease you or anything. What you got? Oh, you, sir. Oh, uh, copper. Copper is a really good conductor. It's a ferrous metal. Yeah, good. Anybody else have something? What do you think? Water. Water can conduct electricity, too. Yeah. Do um, you know what your body's made out of? A lot of? Yeah, a lot of water. So the water within your body, especially like in your bloodstream, limbic system, can conduct electricity really well. There are things that are semiconductors. Probably not going to get into that. So metal, water, flesh, probably a few other things conduct electricity okay. Another thing that's necessary for electric current to happen. Uh, here we go. It's called a circuit, C-I-R-C-U-I-T. Here's a diagram of a circuit. Um, this is what we use to represent something. I'm changing colors. This is what we use to represent something that um, can get those electrons excited. This is a symbol that we use for a battery when we're diagramming a circuit. So I've uh, got a conductor moving like this, we'll say it goes around, and we're going to go like this. I'm just going to continue right through here because I think I'll erase some things. Okay. A circuit is a path where it starts in one point and comes back around to the origin. If I had a railroad track that starts in one place and goes back around all the way to where it started, um, 
it went in a circuit. So some other things that are going to happen here. We're going to represent the flow yeah, of electrons in this circuit with this little dashed line. So that represents the current of the flow of electrons. A few other things that might happen in this diagram of a circuit. There's usually something that's going to do something. Could be a light bulb, could be something else. Um, usually we represent that with something like that. So that's where something goes on. Um, we've got another thing. Let's, um, let's make this a switch. So this is an open switch right now. So when that switch open is open, the flow of electric current is interrupted. Uh, consequently, if you look at the um, alternate language packaging on a lot of um, things like switches, it says interrupter. It's the same thing. So a switch is an interrupter. It interrupts, interrupts the flow of electrons in a circuit. Okay, what else do I need in order to have um, the flow of electricity? You can have things like lightning that um, will occur in the sky and um, doesn't have to have a conductor for that, but uh, it, it's like a spark that jumps from one place to the ground. So it's a little bit different thing going on there. Let's imagine that there's actually just a wire that um, we're sending electricity through. So we got this one and uh, there's some stuff going on inside there. We're going to do a little cross section of what might be in a wire like this. Here we go. This is the strand or the core of a wire, we're going to say, and that's the conductor. If you're actually going to have something that we're going to handle and use, um, even if it's inside a device or other things like that, helps if we have something else going on with that. I'm going to draw, and this is a cross section, so it's like I cut it cut it in half. We'll look at the inside. So there's something on the outside of this conductor. Thing that um, keeps us, keeps you from seeing the conductor that's inside here. Um, keeps you from dying sometimes. Let's us be able to handle this it's called an insulator. I N S U L A T O R. Here's a few things that are insulators. Glass is an insulator. This is actually called a glass insulator. This is a piece that would be on a power line. It's kind of a vintage thing, so it would screw into a mount right here, and your hot power lines would wrap around or be held on um, in a little channel like this. Here's something a lot like that, and this is a uh, plastic insulator. So this is something that probably is going to screw into a house or a boom or something like that and I, you can put a conductor through this. Your conductor might have some other kind of insulator on it. Here is a ceramic insulator. So this has a place where a conductor can go and lever and pull right through there. So this can pull a conductor up against um, a tower or something like that. So ceramic is a good insulator. The insulator on this wire is uh, probably not rubber. Let's see if it um, says on here. Sometimes these will say something. I bet it's just more of like a, a vinyl, but anything that's a lot like rubber is usually a pretty good insulator. Natural rubber is a little more hard to come by, a little more difficult to work with, so you won't, probably won't find things like that as much. Plastic, like on zip ties, a lot of times used to mount conductors on things or hold conductors together. Plastic is a pretty good insulator. This little grid, this little matrix here, I designed after one of my mentor teachers did the same um, kind of lecture, uh, water analogy, electricity lecture. And so I designed this because I had a hard time following uh, more than one teacher talking about all of these things. So I made this one that um, talks about and makes a specific place for um, a technical name for each of the t electrical terms that we'll talk about. 
the unit that it's measured in, usually there's a symbol that is just a letter that describes, lets us use it in an equation, and a place to put um, something about the water analogy in there, where it says it's like. So you'll end up using this, and you'll see exactly where things are going to go, because I'm going to draw this thing exactly like that on the board. It might not have as many lines, but here we go, erasing stuff. This is the part I fast forward through. We're ready to start drawing that matrix. It's going to look about like this. Let's see, I need about that much space. So, water analogy. We're going to start drawing um, the water tower. So, here's the water tower. We're going to say it's kind of like the water towers that are around in our community, maybe. Um, our, let's see, our municipal system that gets us water into your sink, into your shower, relies on gravity. Gravity has to pull water from things that are in higher places to your faucet in order to um, make stuff happen, um, in order to have water pressure. So um, as a, somebody who lives in a valley, you probably see water towers all over the place. Yep, some of them are tall, some of them are just really wide and, uh, and big. Um, and this one relies on being above, above wherever the faucet is in order to get uh, use gravity to pressurize the water that makes it all the way to you. So, um, blue, we're going to do blue for water. Okay, there's water in here. Gravity is pushing down at all times. And we're going to say that, in fact, there's a little standpipe that starts to come down from the water power, from the water tower. The first thing that we're going to describe about electricity is, let's see, unit, yeah, technical name. Um, I'm going to go all the way to over to it's like. It's like water pressure in a pipe pushing the water to you. The name of this thing is electromotive force. Force. Wow. Yeah, you can start to write these ones down because you have a place and you know exactly where it goes. The unit that we use to describe this is volts. All oh, right, you've heard that one before, right? Yeah, I even referenced it yesterday when I was doing etymology. Now, because uh, the property is called electromotive force, the letter that we use to describe it or to talk about it is E. Wait, is the symbol the E or the drawing? Um, yeah, so this is symbol. Oh, yeah. This is um, technical term. This is the unit. And this is, it's like dot, dot, dot. All right. Thanks for calling me on that because I was, yep, that was going to get a little confusing. All right. Things that we measure in volts. Um, we measure batteries in volts. So the um, electromotive force or the volts that a uh, battery has is uh, essentially the pressure that it can push electrons through a circuit. So I take a battery like this, you're able to go look on it. It's not going to focus on there. But um, you're able to go look on it. And um, this one says it's a double A battery. It says it's 1.5 volts. Yeah. Um, how many volts do you think a C battery is? It's a lot bigger than a double A battery. Anybody know right offhand? Somebody probably knows. Nobody knows? Um, hopefully this focus is on there. It's also 1.5 volts. So why is this one, and this one has both the same electromotive force, the same voltage? Well, there's other things going on. Um, so one way to change voltage in a battery is to put batteries in series 
And if you do this, voltage adds up. Um, but if you, let's see, if you end up wiring your two batteries, I'm going to erase this in a second. If you end up wiring two batteries, this is the plus and this is the negative, um, in parallel instead of series, like my, I have my conductor and it splits off and it goes through both of them at the same time. This is called parallel. Um, something else changes. It's the same thing that changes when you have a big 1.5 volt battery versus a small 1.5 volt battery. And uh, it's the reason why we're not only going to have one term here, we're going to have at least four terms going on here. Yeah, I know you can't see this in a, in a screen, but um, maybe some of you guys can see this. This is telling me right here, um, um, let's see, I'm on a setting up here where it's maximum 20 volts. This is the symbol that means a direct current voltage. Um, we'll talk about alternating current when I talk about current. So um, if it's right here, it'll only go up to 2 volts. Right here, it's, um, it's on a 20 volt scale. Um, if I connect this into something else, I'd be measuring a different thing entirely. So um, there we go. I'm going to try out my um, 1.5 volt AA battery and see what I get. Oh, wow, this one's really hot. It's 1.5, almost, oh, 1.6 volts. It's going between those two right now. Can you guys, anybody see it from down there? Okay, cool. I'm going to try out this one, same. Um, it's really low amps, really low volts, so I'm not worried about going through my skin right now. 1.4 volts on that um, C battery, which means that this one's a little bit discharged, probably. So let's go try a different one. I've got a couple of 9 volt batteries. I'm not sure if any of these ones is, um, is fully charged or not. So here I go, in the positive, one in the negative. Um, that one's not there. That one's discharged quite a bit. I'm going to try it out. Anybody ever do this? Mmm, I can feel it. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't taste quite uh, like a full battery. Try this one. Yeah, those ones probably were in the same thing. Those are both discharged. Well, probably they were in like a mixer or something. And I probably took them out because um, the thing stopped working. Ooh, yeah, that one has a little more. It's still a little bit discharged. I, I hopefully, if we got a fresh nine volt out, it would uh, it read nine or a little more. So where those are about one point five volts, there's a hundred twenty volts coming out of this one. And if you have one that has a little bit different characteristics to it, it will probably be a bigger plug or something like that. You might have two hundred forty volts. Uh, those ones are both, well this and the 240 volts are both a completely different kind of system and I'm going to be able to start talking about that because we're moving on to the next characteristic. We're coming back to the water tower and um, we're going to represent something that's inside here. So we're going to say maybe there's a meter here in the water tower that tells us how fast the water is going through the tower on the standpoint at any given time. So there's the meter, a little more um, standpipe, water still coming down through here. Great expo sound right there, right? It's like the speed of water in a pipe. The technical term, you've probably heard it before, is current. I've said it a bunch of times already. I can't talk about electricity without talking about current, especially when I'm using the water analogy. Interesting different letter represents current in an equation. Why is it I? I'm not sure. The unit that we use to measure current is called amperes. But if you'd like to shorten that, you could say amps also. Consequently, the person who started measuring uh, volts and electromotive force, his name was Volta. And the person who started measuring amperes, 
of current, its name was, guess what? Ampere. Uh, amps is like the speed that the electrons flow through a wire. The force of electrons affects the current, but there's other things going on too. Some things that are measured in amps. Electric motors are usually measured in amps. If we have something that's actually at even one amp, it can be dangerous for you. We're going to break it down and go to one one thousandth of an amp. So if I have anything that's uh, going through a, a circuit and it might go through your body, one milliamp, that's one one thousandth of an amp is perceptible. You can feel it. That's like um, maybe when I put the 9 volt on my tongue. If I had 10 milliamps, it can cause your muscles to contract involuntarily. Anybody ever see a TENS system? You can put a little electrode on your body and it'll make your muscles like twitch. I was going to try to find one to use for this, but maybe next time. 100 milliamps. Just a tenth, just one tenth of one amp can cause cardiac arrest. We are going to talk about, for just a second, two kinds of currents. All right, so I drew one circuit already. Um, the circuit I drew before started in one place and it went back around, and um, there's the battery, there's the thing that happened. Here's the switch that opened, it's kind of like drawing a door. Yep, this is direct current, this is what we use to describe direct current usually. Boop, 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 boop. Alright, there's another system entirely, and you know about it because you use it all the time also. Um, so, when you go outside, and you see these power lines on these power poles. Let's draw another power pole right there. And we'll draw another power pole down here. Okay, it's going, it's going on down the hill on towards you. And you see these lines that go like this. Okay, and they're going off all the way. They're going all the way over to Grand Coulee Dam or a power station or something like that. Okay, the um, electricity that flows through this all the way down to the outlet down here is um, called alternating current. Okay, alternating current means this is happening. Um, electricity is flowing for, in one direction for a second. Actually, it's not a second. It's a fraction of a second. And um, then it flows back the other direction for a fraction of a second. Um, so throughout the entire length of this uh, wire, um, and um, there are two here because going one way on one wire and the other way on the other wire, and it does that, how many times a second do you think it does that? 60 here, yeah, 60. It'd be a little bit different in different countries. So the entirety of those wires the electricity is going like that, and like that, just for a fraction of a second. The current is doing that. All the way till we get down to one of these. At that point, we're going through here. All right, and we're going all the way up to here. Now, how can it go both ways on this one wire? Well, if I went and looked inside of this, and there's a good example of it right there, you can see that there are actually two conductors in this one wire. So one conductor is letting the alternating current flow in one direction while it flows the opposite direction on the other one, all the way until it gets to whatever we're plugging it into. And if I took those two wires, if I split the whole thing all the way down, all the way to the power station, or all the way to the generator set, Grand Coulee Dam, I could split the entire wire, that's like this, two conductors, I can split the whole thing apart and have like one really big circuit that just opened up like that. One of the things that, uh, that I've drawn a couple of times looks like this. So that's something we put in a circuit or an electrical diagram and uh, it means more than I said because I just referenced it as something that does something. 
but here you go. We're going to put on this, we're going to go add a little, um, yeah, like this is a little valve that I can turn on and off, and I can let some through or let um, not as much through. And the water's still going all the way down through the standpipe here, but um, maybe not all of it's getting through that yet. This is a pretty elaborate drawing here. So maybe not all of the water is fully getting through there. This one is like a valve that lets some water through a pipe. And also, it's something that does something. So um, the unit that we're talking about here is called Let's, let's do it this way, and this way, and then this way. Okay. Um, the term is called resistance. The unit that we use to measure resistance is ohms. Guess the name of the person that started measuring ohms of resistance. His name is Ohm. Ohm. This one is really great because it's just R. Things that are specified or measured in resistance. Usually speakers in a car stereo system or a home stereo system are rated in ohms. You might have six ohm speakers or four ohm speakers, depending on how much resistance it's putting on the circuit. That amount of resistance affects all of the other things. Pretty cool, huh? Other things that are resistors. Man, I had some things up here that um, I should have gotten out already. Uh, anything that does work and gets hot in a circuit is a resistor. So, a speaker is a resistor, an electric motor is a resistor. Um, what happens when you leave a light bulb on for a long time? It gets hot. A light bulb is a resistor, it does work and it gets hot. Anybody ever see one of these? The whole point of this is to resist the flow of electricity and it gets hot. It also, if, you've ever, if you had a house with one of these ones, what happens when it gets hot? It starts glowing too. So this is almost the same thing as an incandescent light bulb. Um, it wouldn't work the same, and I don't think you'd want to light your house with this because it'd get really hot. Um, but yeah, this is 100% the definition of a resistor. Uh, the type of metal in this resists the flow of electricity enough that it gets super hot, and you don't want to touch this. Um, but there aren't a whole lot of new stove tops that use these anymore. Anybody buy one of these new? They're usually a lot different, like they're, um, yeah, glass or something like that. I have gas stuff at my house. I like it a lot. It's great. I've got three things now, so it lets me create an equation. You know you wanted to do some math here, right? Ohm's law. Electromotive force equals current times resistance. There's a cool thing you can do with these three things um, visually if you want to do some math because you might know two of them and not the other one, but any one of those ones could be the one that's missing. E, since this one is the equal sign, there's a um, line that goes across there and then going to go with the I and the R. That way, whichever one I cover up, I know what kind of math I have to do. If I cover up the E, I need to know that one. I can multiply um, current times resistance. If I need to know what my um, current is, I know I have to divide electromotive force by my resistance. Let's do one that's um, automotive based since it's really easy math. I know that I'm working with a system that is um, 12 volts probably. Let's say I have a really old car or a Volkswagen or something. So I need to know I. I need to know this one. I'm question mark on that one. Um, I know that I'm putting 12 volts directly through a 6 ohm speaker. Is that a good idea? I'm not sure. 6 OHM. Um, all I have to do is divide 12 by 6, and I know that I have how many? What do you got? What do you got? 12 divided by 6. Two. I got 2 amps. Is this a realistic situation in a car stereo? Probably not, unless you just hot wired your battery directly through your speaker, which I don't think you're going to do. The math works out pretty nice on that. I have to keep moving to go fast. So I'm going to give another example of a different formula when I get to that one also. The last thing in this uh, analogy, 
we're going to say I've got this faucet that's coming out. I've got a water wheel that's turning. This water wheel is doing work. It's turning this direction because the water is coming right out of here. There's all the water coming out. It's turning the water wheel. This one is like the amount of work done in a system. Yeah. It goes outside of the pipe at that point, so I guess that, there you go. The thing that we use to talk about that is called watts. Guess who started measuring watts? The technical term is, uh, yeah, it's called power, so watts is right here. All right, um, you'll see and experience people all over everyday life using only this to talk about, only the units to talk about these ideas, and that's totally fine. So if I ever get mixed up like that, um, call me on it. E, I, R, and P. There you go. Those are the ones. So watts is technically the amount of work done in a system in terms of joules per second. But it lets us also um, work P into this stuff also. Here we go. We're going to make something that's called power formula. Formula. And I've saved a few family members and other people, other friends, um, money, and uh, saved them from buying um, electronic devices over again because I know a little bit about how this works. So um, power formula is the most tantalizing one because it goes like this. Power equals I times E. So power equals current times electromotive force. And we can represent power formula the same way we did up here. Um, and it looks like a big pie, too. Oh, man. OK, anybody ever have? Somebody try to charge things with something like this. It could be a black one. It could be a different company. It could be a white one like this. All right, your big device like a, um, like a tablet or um, a bigger smartphone is going to take at least a certain amount of watts in order to charge. It's probably going to take 10 watts to charge their batteries. Now, what I have found on multiple occasions, somebody comes up to me. just happened with my aunt last week. She's got her big phone. She says, hey, this thing won't charge anymore. I can leave it on the charger as long as I try. I can leave it on the charger forever, overnight. The thing will never charge. I think I need a new phone. So here's what I have found that's happening. Happens with iPads. Happens with um, Android devices all the time. You will have several of these sitting around, kicking around in your junk drawer at home. You get a new device, maybe it comes with a new one of these. Some new devices don't even come with this. So you take your device home, you plug it into your wall wart. Maybe you call it a wall wart. It's a power adapter. It's a power supply. Whatever you want to call it. It says power adapter on this one. So this is an Apple device and um, Old iPhones came with a power adapter that looks exactly like this one, but it was different internally. The old iPhones came with a power adapter that charges at a different current. One of the variables in the power formula with a different current than is required for a new device with a big battery. All right, all, here we go, all USB power adapters like this work on 5 volts of electromotive force. Within the power formula, I can put 5 volts right there. That's not going to change. Older power adapters like this would work with about 1 to 1.2 amps of current. A big device like a tablet or a really big smartphone requires, let's say, 10 watts. 
in order to charge. Otherwise, it's not enough to get the battery going and get it filled up. If I tried to charge my big battery at 5 volts and 1.2 amps, I'm never going to get up to 10 watts. All right. More recent power adapters like this. This one outputs 5.2 volts at 2.4 amps. So, I actually increased the voltage a little bit. 5.2 volts at 2.4 amps easily gets us to 12 watts. So I can tell that this one came from a pretty recent iPad or something like that. That's going to charge your battery. That's going to save you from ditching your tablet and going to get a brand new one because you can't get your old one to charge. Um, good luck with that. I hope it uh, serves you and I hope it works for you in your life. Uh, save some of your family members a little bit of cash. All right, here's the cool thing that um, I can do with all of these analogies right here. I'm going to take each one of these ones and I can change water to electron and I can change, most likely I can change pipe to E-I-R-C-U-I-T electrons. This one's a little different though, so maybe this is like a mm, component that lets some, um, we'll just say an electron flow, that's straight up current. A component that lets some current through a circuit, that works pretty well. The amount of work done in a, let's do this, electrical system. There you go. That's the whole thing. Water analogy, all the terms you're going to need ever. Hopefully you can use that in your life and the next upcoming assignment. Thanks for paying attention.